Welcome to Sunday Worship. This week we've invited members of our congregation to choose a favourite Bible passage and to offer a reflection upon it. As we listen to scripture, we hold in our hearts the needs of the world, particularly all those affected by the coronavirus, those in hospital or nursing homes or ill in other places, and all those who care for them. We continue to pray for all key workers and for those in our schools and in our businesses opening again this week. The Collect for the first Sunday of Trinity. Let us pray. O oh God, the strength of all those who put their trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers, and because through the weakness of our mortal nature we can do nothing good without you, grant us the help of your grace, that in the keeping of your commandments we may please you both in will and deed, through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first biblical reflection comes from Joy Loder. Recently, I've been reading through Matthew's Gospel slowly, and these two verses came to me with new, fresh life and meaning. So I thought I would share these verses with you. <coughs> it is one of the parables Jesus taught about the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 and 32. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Like many of you, I'm sure, I have planted quite a lot of seeds over the past few weeks during lockdown. And for the first time ever, I have saved flower seeds or flower heads from some of last year's flowers and have sown them in trays in our small greenhouse. It is fun watching the plants come up and for some of them, I have an, no idea what plant they are going to be as I didn't save or label carefully enough. But that just makes it more fun. I'm looking forward to the surprise of finding out what I have sown. Some of course have come from seed packets and it is obvious what they will be. In the story Jesus uses here, the tiny mustard seed grows into a huge tree where the birds of the air come to rest and make their nests. They find a place of refuge and safety to nest in the tree. In our garden, the wood pigeons have been trying to find a place to nest in the hazelnut trees growing on the Devon stone wall bordering our garden. I haven't been very kind, as I find their cooing rather annoying, so I've been shushing them off to find a place elsewhere. Needless to say, I can still hear their cooing, but not quite so close to the house. What a beautiful picture this is in the story of the seed growing into a huge tree and of the branches of the tree providing a place of safety for the birds to nest in. Was there ever a more beautiful picture than birds making a nest? Of the adult birds going to search for materials to build with and then so carefully making that nest for the female to sit on the eggs and wait for the newly hatched fledglings and then to care for them until they can fly off on their own. In my mind, as I reflected on this parable of the mustard seed growing into a huge tree, I could see those branches extending out all over the world and increasingly people joyfully coming to find a place of safety, rest, security and shelter in the branches. I saw the branches as us, the people of God, as part of the tree, which is Christ. It reminds me of another very well-known and personally loved verse found just a little earlier in Matthew's Gospel, where Jesus says in chapter 11 and verse 28, Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I will try to remember the story of the mustard seed 
and its meaning as I watch the flower seeds growing. To choose verses from the Bible and sing them out as a favourite is difficult. I think there are certain times in our lives that certain verses have more impact and have more relevance. Some people are saying today that we live in uncertain times. That is not necessarily true. One thing we can be certain of is that God is in control and we are never separated from his love and protection. As we wrestle with the difficulties of lockdown, when we're not able to meet together in church, and when we are restricted in seeing our loved ones, I take great refuge in examples of God's continuing protection and love. I have two verses that are relevant today, two verses that give us hope and assurance. My first verse is found in the Old Testament. It's in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, but first I must set the story in context. Jehoshaphat was a king, a good king, who loved God and kept his commandments. Some people told him a vast army was coming towards him to do battle. The people of Judah and Jerusalem came together and Jehoshaphat stood up at the temple of the Lord and said these words. Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress and you will hear us and save us. When Jehoshaphat finished speaking, 
the Spirit of the Lord spoke to the people through Jehaziel, and he said these words. It is words that I wish us all to take hold of today and can be found in verse 15. Do not be afraid of this vast army before you, for the battle is not yours, but God's. There have been many times in my life that I have felt alone and afraid and I've had to remember these words. I've had to remember that as I have put my faith in God, he is faithful to take those fears away and support me. For some dealing with the implications of this virus, it is like a battle. It is referred to in the media as a battle. I'm sure there is someone who you know who works on the front line of the NHS or a care home perhaps. You may even know someone who has been affected by the virus itself. But we need to remember we are not alone. I know there are people who are frightened at this time of what the future might hold. They are feeling alone and many are actually physically alone. But the God who protected his people those many, many years ago is the same God who is with us today. My second scripture is found in Romans. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in Rome, he asked this question. Who can separate us from the love of God? It can be found in Romans chapter 8 verse 35. This verse and the following verses have over the years been a great comfort to me. I trust it can be to you as well. At this time I know there are people who are saying they are in some way separated from God's love and his presence is not with them. The Apostle Paul's response to that question must give us hope and assurance. He says this in verse 38. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. The fact that nothing can separate us from God's love should strengthen us in this most difficult time. It does in my experience. Let us all remember the words of God himself spoken so many years ago. Do not be afraid of this vast army before you, for the battle is not yours, but God's.
One of the earliest Bible texts I learned as a child is to be found at Revelation 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. I did not fully understand this at the time, and it was only later that the significance of the verse became clear. I was still a child when I saw Sir William Holman Hunt's painting, The Light of the World, for the first time. I didn't know that that was its title. What immediately came to my mind was the verse from Revelation that I had learned. The picture shows Christ holding a lighted lantern, knocking at a door which is partly hidden by greenery growing from the ground and coming down from the wall above. He cannot open the door as it has no outward means of being opened. There is no handle or lock on the outside of the door. The only way the door can be opened is from inside by whoever lives behind that door. The message from the picture is quite clear. Christ, as the light of the world, is knocking at the door of your heart, but he is unable to open it. He wants to come in, but has to wait for the door to be opened from inside. His insistent knocking requires a response. If you hear him knocking, you must decide whether to ignore him or open the door and allow him to come into your heart. He will not force himself in. Christ is always there, knocking at the door, calling us to allow him in and be part of our lives. He will continue to do so until he receives a response. When he has that response and the door is opened, he will come in and fill our hearts and remain with us always. The text says nothing about him going away again. And indeed, Christ has told us that he will never leave us, but will send his Holy Spirit to accompany us and guide us on the road of life. I was a young boy during the last war, which resulted in my mother and me going to live with my grandparents, as we had let our relatives who had been bombed out in Plymouth have our house. 
On Sunday mornings before Sunday school, I was allowed to go into my grandparents' room and be with my granddad. In those days, it was the only morning granddad could have a rest, not only from work, but from driving the local fire engine 15 miles to Plymouth during the Brits. These were precious moments for me. On the wall of their bedroom was a large painting which fascinated but frightened me, both at the same time. It was of a woman in a long white robe, barefooted and carrying a lamb in one arm and a shepherd's crook in the other. The frightening part, however, was that she was walking through a terrible-looking place with only a thin shaft of light. I wondered why my, why my grandparents had uh, such a picture in their bedroom, but I could not read the inscription underneath until much older. That image has stayed with me all my life, but instead of being a frightening one, it has become a comfort, especially in times of sorrow. I would now like to read the psalm which contains the words for at the bottom of this picture and which the artist was so vividly portraying. It is, of course, the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord.
Reading taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 to 18. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. These words are very special. They mean a lot to me. I think I think it's because of their simplicity. It gives me inspiration and in how I would hope to live. And when life seems complicated, going back to these words can simplify dilemmas. Love, showing respect for others and all that is around us, caring for God's creation, is to me the essence of what Christ taught us, and these words give perfect guidance. I'll read them again. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. For my favourite Bible passage, I have chosen Psalm 139, sometimes known as the Crown of Psalms. People have always turned to Psalms in times of crisis. The human condition transcends time. The Israelites felt the same emotions as we do. Inability to cope, loneliness, love and joy. 
emotions that we all experience throughout our lives and are perhaps heightened during this time of national and personal crisis. Psalm 139 begins, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in, behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. The God who created the universe knows me and knows me intimately, even knows when I'm going out. As well as being comforting, this is also rather scary. We need to face up to the fact that nothing can be hidden from an all-seeing God. As we pray in our opening collect, Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open and from whom no secrets are hid. The psalmist continues. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. So we see the psalm moves from fear to joy. As St Paul says in Romans 8, verse 38, Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is nothing too dark in this present world that is stronger than God's love and light. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you.
from conception to death. God plans our lives with incredible care and detail. This doesn't mean that we don't have free will. He just knows what we are going to choose and the paths we are going to take before we do. The psalmist finally prays. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The psalmist has moved from fear of being searched to not being able to get enough of it. This speaks to me personally on my own spiritual journey. Fear about the future can be transformed by the knowledge that God is with us all the way. He knows and cares for each one of us intimately and his love and will for us is one of love, forgiveness and hope. Let us pray. O Lord, you have given us your word for a light to shine upon our path. Grant us so to meditate on that word and to follow its teaching, that we may find in it the light that shines more and more until the perfect day, through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.